morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rowley, Adam Mahendra, and all at British Labs for inviting me to give this keynote this year. I'm extremely honoured and humbled to be following the footsteps of some great people, Andrew Prescott, Bill Thompson, Tim Hitchcock, David Arua, Melissa Terrace, George Oates, and Josie Fraser. In this talk, Mahendra gave me the brief of addressing how I and many of my brilliant colleagues, friends, and peers have inspired people to do amazing things with digital experimentation. I'll try to talk for 45 minutes. I'll probably speak less than that. I'm usually quite fast about doing these things, so you might be able to get some catch-up time as well. Anything that I say in this talk, you can tweet, you can tell people about, you can do whatever you want with. I'll take full responsibility for everything I say. Anything controversial is my fault. <laughs> and I'm going to tackle what a lab could be, what it might mean to you. Um, I'm going to talk about a reflexive part of my career. I'm going to talk about some of the things that Adam described. As there's a theme of 3D for this symposium as well, I might talk a little bit about that as well. Um, this talk is actually online now. If you follow me on Twitter, you can find the, the links. You can look at what I'm going to talk about. If you find it boring, you can leave. <laughs> <laughs> so since the inception of the lab in 2013, I've attended all of these apart from one. I've always gone away with a slight fear of what could happen if we actually applied it in different places. I usually go away envious as well, thinking... I'd love to be able to do some of this stuff. People inspire me. I've learnt new things. I've met new people. <coughs> I've gone away and actually tried to apply it to my own work. Sometimes it's worked. Sometimes it hasn't. At the moment, we're seeing digital labs around the world being chipped away at, which is a real shame. Labs are really, really important to our daily work, in museums, libraries, and archives and galleries. At the moment, we're seeing what's happening in DPLA, and New York Public Library's labs have disappeared as well. But this lab has achieved really, really good things. Think about what Mario Klingman has, has achieved recently with his Lehman Prize and working for Google, what Katrina has managed to do, and the Sherlock Net project as well. All these things are absolutely amazing. And without this project, I don't think those things would have happened. So just moving on slightly. <coughs> a couple of these things you might recognise. This is one of Mario Klingman's works. This is a GAN. Many of you won't be able to use these without a really high-powered computer. I work for a museum in Cambridge that definitely can't do this at the moment. We just can't afford to buy these sort of computers. In the future, maybe we can. And many of you might recognise this sort of thing. You are the only person working in your organisation who perhaps is doing this work. You are a bus factor. And this is something that kept coming up when I was at the British Museum. I was the only person who knew how some things worked, but I tried to share that knowledge. And British Library Labs has shown me the value of actually sharing knowledge as well. And without sharing it, your projects might die. And that's something that I think you need to go back to. Digital preservation is a really big problem for the sector at the moment. So what sort of challenges are we seeing in our sector at the moment? The dearth of skills is definitely very apparent. If anyone tries to recruit developers or IT specialists for this sector, it's very hard to get a really strong list of candidates. Quite often we only get 10 to 15 people applying. And that's usually not enough for some roles. Attracting funding for these types of activities is very hard. I know that Mahendra is going through all sorts of problems trying to make sure this is a long-term project. He's not alone in this sort of thing. Other people are struggling as well to keep their projects going. Quite often they get funded for three-year cycles and nothing after that. And this is a problem. We're doing really, really important work. We need to work out how to sustain them. We need to prove that it's a value of core activity to museums and archives and galleries. And quite often there's a little bit too much fixation with text mining and some of the work that we see. There's more things out there. GIS is there, 3D mapping, sonification. And one of the big things that I see as a problem for museums at the moment is licensing. Revenue generation is all too apparent. We've been told to find new revenue streams. This is a really hard thing to do. We're all fighting for the same thing. Sponsorship is very hard to achieve now. We're also very worried about disruptive technologies. Now, many of you have got a mobile phone in your pocket. That's probably the biggest disruptor to museums out there. Bill's tweeting away in the front row at the moment. That sort of thing can actually change your interaction with the public. It could make my talk go out in completely the wrong way if people take it the wrong way when I'm, tweeting, when I'm talking about it. But we've got to embrace it. So in the twilight of my career at the British Museum, I was accused of running shadow IT and dangerous technology. <laughs> hmm. Now I found this very hard to deal with. Now I came to events like this, and I learned these methods from people like you. Does that make you all purveyors of shadow technology? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. Now, most of the technology I use was things like Solo. It's open source technology. Now, what sort of companies are using that? Netflix. I mean, that's not really shadow IT. It's stuff that's really well documented, and it's really, really powerful. 
So I found that very hard to bear, and so did some of my colleagues. And this came from the enterprise department and IT. Maybe it's because I was doing things that they couldn't actually do without going through change control. I was experimenting. That's what you guys are doing. All of you are trying to experiment with various bits and pieces. So now I'll talk a bit more reflexively about some of the things I've done over the past 15 years of my career. That makes me feel very old now. I'll first give you the Portal Antiquity Scheme, which I worked on for 13 years. This is still going very strong. It's a really important project for the archaeology community of this country. And it records objects that the public are finding through metal detecting and other disruptive activity. It's not a perfect project. Nothing ever is. But it's doing very interesting things. It's based around open source technology, and it allows you to visualise where objects are being found. You can do network analysis of objects. This is an example of an Iron Age coin, Cunabalin, found from 10 AD to 40 AD. This is the mint, where the white dot is, and the radiating out is where those things were found in the countryside. You can do really interesting things with data. They never thought this was going to happen. This came out of a grant from Creative Works London. Without that money, we've never experimented. And it's definitely a very, very big story of discovery. It's about people's daily lives. People like you are going out and finding archaeological objects. They're recording them with the British Museum, and they're allowing people to see them online, digitally, in real time. There's not many other projects that are out there doing this sort of thing. And coming to these sort of events, I learned about linked data. It was the very first time that I actually started playing with linked data was after one of these projects. This is an example of Commodus being brought out of Wikipedia onto the Portland Antiquities Game website. I suddenly realised that when we were working on this project, we were writing biographies and regurgitating information that was already online. Why are we doing that? Why aren't we using Wikipedia as our content management system and bringing that data back in? And it was very easy to do. Anyone can do this. It's not just them. Just put into your database the identifiers. The Pelagius project, for instance, is a very good example of this sort of work happening. That project has achieved great things over time and is becoming infrastructure for many people, but again is on tenuous funding. So the Port Antiquity Scheme website was a mashup of mashups. There were so many different APIs in that system, but they've been very heavily hit by things like the Google Maps charging system. And then I'll give you this project as well. Now, this was completely unfunded, and one of my favourite projects I ever worked on. This is the Day of Archaeology, which is a collaborative seven-year blogging project. This came out of a Twitter conversation between Lorna Richardson and Matthew Law, uh, and snowballed into a, a massive event, but talked into an echo chamber of people who worked in archaeology talking to each other. However, it has created an archive of careers advice that people can go along and find out everyday situations of what people do in archaeology. There's not many other projects that have done this sort of thing. There's a day of digital humanities. It hasn't worked in the same way. And now I'll move on to Micropass. Now, this is a crowdsourcing project, but also looked at crowdfunding. This is one of the biggest failures of our project life in the teams that I worked in. It's the only thing that didn't work, crowdfunding. Now, why did crowdfunding not work? Well, if you know archaeologists, they have no money. <laughs> Going out to them asking to crowdfund something is doomed to failure in many ways. And this had a really outstanding team working on it. Some of these people are in the room at the moment. There's Jennifer Wexler. There's Addie Keenan, who's a superb hire for the uh, British Library at the moment, who's in the second row over here, and she'll be talking later. And we attempted to set out and reach a different crowd to normal. We wanted them to power our work. So, this is very different to my normal projects. We didn't actually know we had a crowd. And Steve Blank said this, and it's very much a Field of Dreams type project. We did build it and hope people might come to it. Did they? Yes, they did. The British Library is doing this as well with LibCrowds. You're not sure there's a crowd out there to help them with this. It uses the same technology, LibCrowds, as MicroPass, but it's succeeding. Now, very publicly in 2014, at the DH conference, Deb Verhoeven told me it was doomed to fail. I'm very hopeful that we have proved in part wrong that one part of our project worked, one didn't. I don't really care that crowdfunding failed. We tried it as an experiment, and it shows that that didn't work. We documented it, and people know that it didn't work. So that's the good thing. I'll just leave that second, because I think people are taking pictures. Go for it, Vera. So this is an example of one of the things we worked on. This is the Bronze Age Index from the British Museum. This is 30,000 cards, and Jennifer's in the room as well, who worked on this index. So she's going to get talked about a little bit more as I talk through this. The curator who's behind the the mould cape here is Neil Wilkin, and he assumed that it had taken 13 years by hand to transcribe all these index cards. He was scared about doing this sort of thing. Quite rightly so. So a lot of his time would have been spent going through an archive and making it accessible. This archive is kept in North London, and you can only go and see it if you made an appointment, and he sits there and looks at you while you're look looking through these cards. <laughs> now, that's not a very good use of his time. It's not a very good use of any of your time either. 
So we want to make it digital and allow people to use it. But we're not the only people doing this sort of work. People like Dig Ventures are trying out all sorts of things in this space as well. They're trying lots of innovation. Archaeology is very good about trying innovative new things and ditching them when they don't work. <coughs> they pick and choose very well. So what do these cards look like? Well, here's some examples. Some of you might say they're quite beautiful. Some of you might just say, <coughs> archaeology data, Bronze Age stuff. There's a running joke from my colleagues that I hate prehistory. By the end of this project, I actually quite liked it. The images are amazing, the text is awesome, and there's some really good stuff to do. But many of you might ask, why did we not try OCR out on these records? <laughs> I think you might see the challenges straight away. We did try it, it didn't work. But also, the person who wrote all this data down wasn't that methodical at times. So things didn't go in the right boxes. So we would have had to look at them anyway as a human to try and disentangle this. And the crowd are very good at going through this. So Jennifer, with unwavering patience, used this machine here. And she fed these records through that when she could. What we hadn't accounted for was the fact there was tape on the records and paper clips. And some of them were a bit too big for the machine. And we assumed that the machine might work at 600 sheets per second. It did not do that. Jennifer, I think, spent 13 months going through this and probably wishes she never saw that machine again. I might be paraphrasing or putting words in their mouth there, but that could be the, the case. And this is an example of what the data capture looked like. It was just structured data going into fields. It's very, very simple. And how many people got involved in this sort of thing? Well, 3,000 people started helping us with this project in the end. Two people stood out and did lots of work for us. Dennis Antoine did thousands thousands of records. And I've forgotten the name of the other one. That's bad. But she did loads and loads as well. She was based in Africa in a, sh in a shipping container. She did it in her spare time in the evening and really helped us out. So these records went online. We then started working with all sorts of different people. Some of you may have affiliations with these projects that are on screen now. Some of them are overseas. We tried to work on sustainability to make sure this project became part of people's daily lives in archaeology and museums. We wanted it to become a project people were proud of. People were very pleased to be associated with the British Museum. The British Museum less so with this project. We got one piece of publicity in the newspapers about this project. And I think all of you know that if you want projects to succeed, you need to talk about them regularly. You need to promote them regularly. And without publicity, it doesn't work. Social media at the moment is very much about on this day stuff. Things that don't really matter that much to people. It comes and goes each year, and quite often you see the same thing being tweeted by the British Museum and other places. I'm bored with that sort of thing. I want to see talk, people talking about the research and how it can make an impact to people's daily lives. <laughs> this project could have already helped help people. I went to a couple of conferences and I showed people how this project worked. On the top right-hand corner is the Montpellier Foundation from Virginia in America. They were really enthused by Micropass and they wanted to learn how to do this. So they taught themselves looking at our documentation and they're now putting up projects for pub public to participate in. We didn't fund them to do this and neither did the AHRC that funded this project. And that's a really strong output for this sort of thing for me. That other people want to use our work and start building on it. LibCrowds is the same. People could download that code and do the same thing with their collection if they wanted to. And I hope that project continues as long as it can. The problem you have with that project is retaining the staff to work on something that's called PyBosser. Not many people know how that works and can extend it. Maybe you will find someone. But we did other things as well through crowdsourcing as well, things that we never thought were possible. We started producing really high-quality 3D models using the crowd. We had a very boring task for most people, drawing around the backgrounds and removing the background for photo masking. Now, you can do this computationally now as well. We didn't have that at the start of this project. We had images taken in galleries with backgrounds in them, with people walking past them. So it makes it harder to remove them if you don't know very much about computer vision or other techniques. But the public generated over 100 models for the British Museum, the Palestine Exploration Fund, and other people. These could be downloaded and printed at home. They were printed in America, in, in Washington Public Library, the day after we put them up. People did some amazing things. So I'm now going to move on to the crowdfunding aspect. This is the failure part. So we built this on Ruby on Rails using a project called Neighborly from Brazil. We went out around the world looking for software, and it worked really well. The software was excellent. 
like I said earlier, the crowd that we went out to, less so excellent. But one thing we wanted to achieve and help to inspire people with was documentation. Everything that we did was documented as much as we could do. We wanted to make sure you could take it and run it yourself. Reproducibility is really important in our sector now. We don't have much money, and it's really important that people might see our tools and learn from them and re reuse them. We have a really strong level of cultural capital in the, in the capital here. We're very privileged. I worked at the British Museum. We had resources. We had colleagues. I now work for a local museum with MPO status. We do not have the same facilities. We do not have as many staff. I'd love to be able to apply the methods I have from the British Museum there, and I'm trying. We have a duty for the rest of the world to actually show that they can use our tools as well and reuse them. Photogrammetry, for instance, for 3D, is one such example that anyone could do that. You do not need expensive equipment. You can use the camera phone in your pocket and some software from the internet, and you can produce 3D models and produce really high-quality stuff. So how often do you go to a conference where people berate the audience and say, museums must be doing this, but they don't provide them with the tools to actually do it? And it's always the big museums telling people to do this. The little museums and archives are thinking that, I'd love to do this, but how do I do it? Show us how to do it. And this sort of thing shows people how to do it, and they can reuse it. I think I saw earlier Harrison Pym walked into the room. And he inspired me greatly at the British Museum when he was there. He's a young data scientist with lots of ambition, skills, and imagination about things to do. And unfortunately, Ben Osteen isn't here today, and he helped me with this project as well. I wanted to broaden my skill base, and I wanted to learn about computer vision and how to look at people's faces in pictures, identify them in the British Museum archive using Sparkle. And with their help, I produced this project, which is now online, but probably doesn't work unless Sparkle endpoint's up. And if anyone uses Twitter, they might come across a, a bot that keeps looking at the BM's Sparkle endpoint saying, is it up, is it down? <laughs> That's nothing to do with me, by the way, before anyone asks. <laughs> and we're now in the end of the free tool, now, this is a really important problem for a lot of us in this room. If you're not on the Flickr Commons, your images are at risk. I can't remember how many images the British Library's got in there now. It's millions. That's probably correct. For the, for the Micropass project, we have 25,000 images. Unless we pay the £49 ransom fee, they could get deleted. And there's only 1,000 left online. Many of you have websites that use Google Maps. Unless you're paying lots of money now, you're probably worrying about what you can do with it. I've deprecated Google Maps in many of my projects and now moved over to Leaflet or not using Maps at all. People can't afford to keep doing this stuff. And we have to remember, nothing is free. Someone is paying for it all the time. I never understood how Flickr could give you all one terabyte of free data. One terabyte of data is a lot. Times up by millions of users. Who is paying for that in the end? Someone is. So I've also been thinking about digital loss recently. Now, how many of you in this room can remember web quests or creative spaces or world timelines? Not many, I would think, because they disappeared without trace. If you look at some of the sites now, they're squatted by porn sites. <laughs> These were funded by the government for quite a high level. You might find them a wayback machine, but this is something you need to think about as well. It's about long-term preservation of your assets. How do you make sure they're available <coughs> once your project finishes? And that's an experiment in itself. You can try different things out there. So now I'm going to move on to 3D as we're going to have that as a theme for the rest of the conference, and you can see things outside with Cyriel and other people. And 3D is something that I sort of fell into by, by luck in many ways. I went to a conference um, seminar session that J.D. Hill organised at the British Museum. And they talked about 3D. Graham Earle, who some of you will know, team, they scanned the Easter Island statue. And I was like, wow, we could do that. How do we do it? But I didn't really have the means at the time. And then we started working on the Micropass project. And I suddenly realised it was something we could do. Any museum can start doing this. Any archive can start doing it. I've been very lucky to get in cases with iconic objects. Things like the Rosetta Stone. It's not as really interesting close up. I was quite disappointed, actually, when I got in the case with it. <laughs> the hieroglyphics are very, very shallow on this object as well. It makes it very hard to get them in, into the screen. You will also notice there's problems with the case. How do I get around the back of it? Well, I couldn't. So I took pictures through the glass. So it's not an ideal model. I'm now going to let you to a secret as well about the 3D model I made. Part of it's done from the replica that's in the gallery too. <laughs> so the top and the bottom, I went into gallery two and scanned that instead. So it's a pastiche of the object. It's not the real thing, but it's as close as they're going to get at the moment. And we tried to publish our 3D data in a different way. Now, 
Photogrammetry allows you to do reproducible science very easily. So I wanted to make sure for our images were up for anyone to reuse. Now, where could I do that for free at the moment? I say free at the moment. That's GitHub. I put data up in repositories and allow people to download this. So Sophie in the front row could download this data. And she might have a more powerful computer than I had, which is very likely, because I was doing it on a work computer with eight megabytes of RAM. Not enough to really do it. And she could produce a really high-resolution model and download it and reuse it in her environment and do something with it. Sometimes I put them under, up under a different license to what I was meant to, and people have downloaded it under that. You can't revoke that license. So some people could use this data commercially. That was my fault, because I wasn't paying attention when I put the data online. I've put that slide out of sequence, so I'll mention that now. Uh, so other things I was doing at the, the BM was playing around with Facebook and social media and trying to help them out. I wanted to make sure we could archive their data so people could reuse it. This is something we're not very good at in museums and archives. We do stuff on social media, but we aren't keeping a record for people to go back to. We're not keeping track of the conversations. We're using it for impact of what we think our marketing is doing. So I downloaded all the data I could out of Facebook for people to play with. And then Harrison, I think, he started coding it up for what sort of things were going on. And you might have seen a paper that him and Colleen published recently about the toilets at the British Museum being the thing that most people complain about alongside probably cake, <laughs> attitude of staff, uh, funding, you know, that sort of thing. So this is an example of 3D scanning and publication that we were doing at the British Museum. So I decided that 3D could be a pipeline towards revenue as well. People might want to buy these models, and we know that other people have been doing this already. The Ashmolean's done it for a while. Lots of places are doing it. And working in conjunction with a company called Think C 3D from Oxford, we produce 3D models. Now, most of these models I created in my lunch break, walking to the canteen. So this famous one on the right-hand side is Antinous. And this was made from just 60 photographs. It's not particularly highly refined, but it made a model that was good enough to make a cast of and sell in the British Museum shop. They've sold them for £250 at the beginning price. I think that's slightly high. I'm still convinced that people want to buy things like chocolate in th 3D prints, things like that, that they'll buy lots of and they'll go back for regularly and more, more often over time. Things like this you'll buy once, and you probably won't buy again, unless you want a bookend by the end. This weighs three and a half kilograms. It's ideal for bookends. But then things like Sketchfab store around as well. People could start downloading these models and they could install them into computer games. You might see cultural content in something like Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed. That sold 130 million units. That's far bigger reach than any of us will get from our museum websites. This is an example of it being sold in the BM shop. Now, unfortunately, they went for an object that I thought was pretty poor scan. It's one of my first scans I ever did in the British Museum. And that's the one on the right-hand side, which is the statue of Roy. I wasn't really sure why they wanted to start with that one. I would have started with Antinous or another object. So lots about choices. People have to think carefully about what they're doing. Data drives decisions as well. Look at how many people are downloading those objects in the first place. Could be a good start to show you whether people are going to use it. And they also wanted to think about 3D feeding projects as well. 3D has got so many applications around the world now. You can use it for some really interesting things. Touring, things like handling objects on buses. There's a bus that goes around India at the moment with one of the exhibitions, and people can handle 3D objects that are in the exhibitions. You can't handle the real thing, but a 3D object could be the nearest thing to it. If someone drops it and breaks it, does it really matter? You go and print another one. That's the thing. If you drop one of the iconic objects from the VM or from another museum, you're in trouble. <laughs> you can put stuff into a blog. You can embed things. You can do virtual reality. You can do fantastic projects like Project Nomad, which Rabira might talk about to people who are outside later on as well. You can do handling elements for Room 3. We started putting things into Room 3's gallery with the curator, Neil Wilkin. He tried to push the boundary of what they could do in that room. So we had 3D prints, again, by Think See 3 d We put 3D models on display digitally on screens as well. But we got into that spinning object phase, which everyone who looks at 3D thinks, well, that's not really in in inspiring or useful. The useful thing about 3D is you can now start annotating it. You can encode curatorial knowledge. That's a really interesting concept. You can start telling people through the object what things mean, why things are broken why I've covered up things on the Rosetta Stone and I've scanned it, even though I haven't actually done that yet. I should really be a bit more transparent about that. And I'm hoping this might work. So we did a collaborative project with Google in Room 3 called XWiFi. Uh, Bill came and played with this. It's using mobile phones to connect with the wall. He didn't download an app, and he controlled the, the scene. Sometimes it didn't work because the router went down. It's an experiment. We're trying new things out. And is this, you got sailed with chanting. And this just shows you how people were using their mouse. 
using their phone as a mouse to activate hotspots. Like that chanting gets very annoying very quickly if you're in that room for a long period of time. So Rafi, who's in this room, did some evaluation for us. I think she would have gone mad if that sound was on eight hours a day for the whole time she was there. I spent three days in there with a Google engineer with that playing, and we both wanted to kill each other by the end of it. <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic chanting. I mean, it's obviously got value to people, but it does make you feel a bit weird by the end of it. So this project was led by T. Uglu from Google's Creative Lab in Sydney, and it was amazing working with them. It was an experiment all the way through. It was iteration. It was playing. It was playful. It pushed the British Museum's staff to the limit. They found it very hard to comprehend that people would be de delivering assets at the last minute and tweaking things. Why was it not delivered on the day as a package that we wouldn't go back and test it? There were things that we changed during the exhibition as well. It was iterative design. And that's what you need to think about as well. So the team that I had working at the British Museum worked with a huge amount of curatorial staff. These are some of the names of the people they worked with. But this wasn't enough for some people. And I ended up leaving. But I quite often found that I was helping colleagues out at short notice as well doing other experimental work. So if any of you have been to the British Museum and used the audio guide, there's a little app on there where you put your phone on a, a reader at the end, an NFC tag, and it sends you what you've been to see. I was asked to build an API for that in two weeks and push it out. I learned some new things, I experimented, and it's still working. It's documented so they can run it and they can move it without me being there. Whether they do or not is a different matter. So. And we also put our data into something called Oculus VR, which is embedded on Facebook. I'm hoping this video might work. Possibly won't. It's very low res. This is a capture from the screen. This gives you an idea of going through the gallery, Gallery 4, where most of my models were made in the morning. This is the Egyptian gallery. I come through the front door of the museum, and I walk down the Egyptian gallery up to my office. People didn't bother me in the morning, so I could take 3D models very easily. There's some great objects in there. They're all photogrammetric models, and these are put into Facebook. This cost the museum nothing. It was done on my equipment, was using my mobile phone and my, my camera and my laptop that I had. People can create great things for your institution. I'm sorry, you've lost the um, line at the bottom. But you can do fantastic things with very little money. And sometimes having no money breeds creativity as well. And I think that's sometimes things we forget about as well. That people without money can do just as much as people with lots of money sometimes. Don't discount that. So my time at the British Museum ended in redundancy in February, which... I was very sad about. I gave a lot of my life to that place. And I think anyone who's been through redundancy knows it's a very hard time. Doing it at Christmas is a pretty horrible thing to anyone. So if any of you manage staff, please think about what you do with decisions at Christmas time. It has a big effect on people's family lives and other things. But I was very fortunate. I now work in this really nice institution, the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge. And what am I doing? Well, I'm trying to transfer what I learnt in London to a new place. And I manage a team that does some fantastic stuff. I run the photography team, I run documentation, the image library and various other things. And I'm trying to instill into them an idea that they can experiment and do things that they don't normally do. I want them to challenge themselves and do stuff. Stuff that actually have impact on people's lives and that they have fun doing. Which is something they've not really had before. It's like you will do a business service and that's it. But I want them to learn more things and get better. Before I got there, they ran a 3D competition where people were invited to take scans done by Scan the World and reimagine them. They did some really good stuff, like this hologram in the gallery. They put people's work into a gallery. People from the street, it wasn't museum staff, it was people from the street, and they showed it off. Very much like this event, it's showing other people's work off. That's what museums, galleries and archives should be doing, showing what people are doing with their work to get public impact and showing the government that their stuff is important. And we've now started to create 3D within the organisation as well. This is quite simple for us, the same model as we use at the British Museum, using photogrammetry. But we've also managed to achieve funding as well. We've had a grant for £19,000 for an Artec Leo, the new handheld scanner. I very much realised when I was at the British Museum that if you did stuff without funding, people very, found it very hard to go back to trustees and say, we're doing this work, and then go, how are we going to fund it in the future? How are we going to sustain, sustain it? So now I've changed tack. I'm now trying to get money to fund this work to show what we're doing. And I've applied for some grants. We've now got nearly £300,000 to do 3D work in the Fitzwilliam Museum for this year, with four postdocs being advertised shortly for six months. The downside in this postdocs is they have to be in post for the 1st of January. That's a very short turnaround. We've tried to extend it, but we can't. But what I'm also trying to do is teach curators how to do this. 
curators are the people you have to convince quite often about what you're doing and why you're doing it, apart from the business staff of the museum. They're the guardians of the knowledge. The collection is the bedrock of everything we do. Without a collection, your institution is nothing. It's something we forget about sometimes. So this is the very first model that one of my colleagues, Melanie Pitkin, made. She was ecstatic when she saw this come out of the machine. She didn't never thought she could do this sort of thing. It took her 15 minutes to learn the photography skills and two hours to run the processing. And Cambridge has some really amazing objects as well. If any of you have been to the Classical Archaeology Museum, you will have seen this cast of the Termi Boxer. This is quite a challenge to actually scan. It's got fingers that are quite close together. It's got apertures that are hard to get to. But it comes out really nicely if you spend some time with it. I went back three times at lunchtime just to scan this object and produce this, and I'm quite pleased with the result. It's an experiment for me. I was trying out new things. It's done in a gallery with really appalling light, with no access conditions around it. I didn't get on the ladder. We've recently started running workshops for the public as well. I want the public to learn how to do this. We're trying to devolve 3D creation outside the museum's expertise. I want people to get better and learn new things. But Cambridge also has amazing collections of other stuff as well. It's zoological collections. All this stuff is now starting to appear in 3D. It's not just down to one person doing it. It's a devolved team of people. That doesn't mean that we can't still work with companies. There's still that opportunity for people to come in and work with us and help us do this sort of thing. But I want us to be self-sustaining and sufficient in what we're doing. And we're now starting to move into things that the British Library is very, very versed in. Triple IF is something we're trying out now. We need to start doing more of this in the Fitzwilliam. The University Library is doing this, but we're not. So we're providing our images to the University Library and they're putting them online for us at the moment. But soon, we hope to be doing this for ourselves. But we need to learn from people. And that's something that this sort of event can do. I could find someone here who's very, very expert in this, and they could tell me where we can get better. And we now start to look at broadcast as well. This is something I've been very keen on since Nicholas Sorota and McGregor spoke in 2009 at the Tate about the museum as a broadcaster. I think the museum is a broadcaster of knowledge. Maybe not just broadcaster of TV, but a broadcaster of knowledge to different people. So we're trying out different things like short videos about Egyptian coffins at the moment. And I'm turning them to storyboards as well using uh, one of Google's apps. So you get cartoon-type stuff for social media. We're also looking at uh, maker-in-residence-type programmes as well. One of my former colleagues, Ina Priegel and Kate Noble, have talked about this recently at the MCG conference, and I think this is where museums can get more specialised in as well, working with the public to create things. Creation is an amazing thing. It makes people sit there and wonder when they can actually do something with your content, something that's tangible and useful. I'd also like to turn to a couple of things that have changed my life and career. It got mentioned earlier on about Linked Ancient World Data Institute that I saw in New York. Now, this was funded by the National Endowment for Humanities and brought together a, a series of scholars to talk about linked data and how it would impact on their research. We came together and experimented and learnt new things. And the collaborative coming together of minds has changed our careers. It's changed our working aspects. People like Elton Barker, who's in this room as well now, is a collaborator and we're looking at working on projects together. Without going on something like this, I would never have actually delved into linked data in the same way. And then secondly, I went to something called MSU Digital Archaeology Institute of Practice, which was run by Ethan Watcher and Lynn Goldstein. It was an incredible experience. For two summers, we brought together 20 students. Students is a loose word. Some of them were 60, some of them were 25. They wanted to learn how to do things in digital space. On the right-hand side is one of my heroes of digital space. This is Sean Graham. Many of you might have come across him. He's the electric archaeologist on Twitter and social media. He documents everything he does. And one of the things that he does really well is documenting failure. He tells you where he's gone wrong and publishes it. and shows you how you don't make the same mistakes. And that's something we're not very good at, is telling people where we've gone wrong. We only celebrate success. And that's something you could talk about with labs as well. So with these awards, we are celebrating people's successes. But some people could say, I've tried things out. What did not work? And that's really important, because we might go for a funding bid based on something that did not work. And you sitting there in the background going, I tried that. And it didn't work. So, but I didn't publish about it. So how am I going to know? So just going back to research projects. Well, these are some of the problems you might have. And this is something I've encountered working in the museum world. Funding doesn't often support routine tasks of digitisation. That is one of our big problems. How do we digitise our collections for people without having funding for it? I haven't got an answer for that. I'm not going to pretend I have. Things come onto the scene that are really trendy at the moment. Immersive technology is really key at the moment to a lot of people's funding, but it's quite hard to do. 
Virtual reality installations are hard for museums and archives to run. They get in the way quite often. There's cleanliness problems. Are they ideal for it? You could try other things like HoloLens technology. There's things you could think about, but you need to know about it. Unless you go to something like this, how are you going to learn about it? And quite often, all costs are really minutely managed as well. If you need any extra money for contingency, quite often it's not there. There could be something that comes up. Equipment breaks. One of the problems I have at the Fitzwilliam at the moment is cameras. I cannot afford the latest phase one camera for my staff. They drop and break it. So we might be out of action for cameraman for a year while we try and find funding. And then something else I thought I'd bring up as well is recently the Arts Council have announced tech champions. And I thought there's one glaring omission amongst the list of jobs that they've come up with. They've got six roles, I believe. But what's missing at the moment is anyone championing digital research and value experimentation. They're looking at CRM, they're looking at data and analytics. They're looking at all the things that were seen as digital transformation at the British Museum that have been canned in the last year. Things that they thought might work but failed. But what about the collection? What about your experiments and getting better? I think that is far more important sometimes than some of the other roles that they've chosen. It's not a criticism. It could be how they found the funding. But I would like to see that sort of role coming up. I thought I'd give you a couple of other examples as well of things that you could go to as well. Some of you may have heard of something called Mozilla Festival or MozFest. It was held two weekends ago in uh, Ravensbourne College in, in Docklands. 2,000 people came to celebrate the open web. I only went to this because Andrew Prescott mentioned it to me over a beer a couple of years ago and said, you must go to this sort of event. It's where you will get better and you'll learn new things. And this year I decided to do a pop-up museum and I put in a, a proposal at the very last minute, the day before it was meant to go in. And it got to about two days before the conference, well, the event, and I was a bit worried about things actually working. And I sought out people who were going. In the front row, I had three colleagues who actually helped on this as well. Jennifer Wexler, who's in the audience as well. Abira, Sophie and Ed came along and showed off their project, Nomad Project. And it was the star of the show. People came across and interacted with their event and saw it and went, wow, that is amazing. How did you do that? And you talked about it and said, we experimented various things. And it took us a year to build it. Abira used content from the British Museum, but didn't ask permission to use it in the same way as you would traditionally. She did it and produce something fantastic, and I hope you get to see it at some point. She's done augmented reality and the HoloLens stuff. I'm nearly finished now. So this is my wife using virtual reality for the first time. She's looking at a Bronze Age roundhouse that you can't actually see online at the moment. Uh, the BM won't let people see it. They had a licensing deal with Samsung that says you cannot push this outside. But I've got several things that I think museums and archives and galleries should think about being. Participation is really, really key to what we're all doing. Making people participate in what we're doing is difficult. If you people don't participate, you're lost. Serendipity is a really, really big thing as well for your archive. Why are we telling people what they should do with it? Why aren't we just letting them use it and produce great things? And that's the, what's been coming out of your events. People are doing stuff you never thought they would do. You're definitely innovative here, and you're definitely world-leading. There's nothing else that comes near this, and you're very open. Reproducibility you can actually achieve if you document it. And I hope that people are inspired by this event. So just returning back to the British Library Labs, the whole reason we're here is to celebrate the success of what people are doing. This project must become part of the, US, uh, the BL's business as usual portfolio. It has to become something that it does all the time and think about sustaining. And I hope that we hear shortly that they will be funded long term and become part of the considerable armory to go alongside digital curators who do fantastic things. Like I said earlier, I'm very jealous of what they managed to achieve here. And I hope to see more things coming out of this in the future. The recent moves to create a global labs network can only be lauded, and the plaudits that came out of the Twitter stream from the symposium recently were amazing. I was sitting in um, Japan at the time, or was I back from Japan? I think I was in the airport looking at the Twitter stream going, wow, these guys are producing fantastic things. And so that's the end for me. But what I want to ask you all is to take some of my provocations to heart and to perhaps try and do some new things. If you're not documenting your work, perhaps start documenting. If you're not sharing stuff with people, share it with people. And above all, please enjoy the rest of today. And thank you to everyone for coming to listen to me. Thank you.